I don't hide nothing back. I, I barely, I, I mean, I mean, I come from a family, man, of, of poor welfare. You know what I'm saying? I, when I came out my, mom, my, my mother's womb, I was on welfare. What do you guys do to get back, give back to the community? What is going to be your thing for the community? Nothing. <laughs> Let's talk about where you guys going. You guys like all out of here, going to Europe? Yeah, well, we're going to Europe yeah, tonight. Yeah. Jesus, what you doing, Jesus? <laughs> uh, working on um, your my album. album. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, looking for new girls to put babies in. Hi. <laughs> Throughout hip-hop history, certain artists left an indelible mark on the genre, their legacies both celebrated and marred by their personal struggles. Among them stands a figure whose enigmatic personality, raw talent, and turbulent life have garnered both admiration and criticism. The iconic rapper, Old Dirty Bastard. Born Russell Tyrone Jones, he emerged as a founding member of the legendary Wu-Tang Clan, revolutionizing the rap scene with his eccentric style and unapologetic lyricism. However, Beyond his artistic brilliance lay a tumultuous existence, marked by a series of legal troubles that perpetually overshadowed his career. Russell Tyrone Jones was born on November 15, 1968, in the Four Green section of Brooklyn, New York. He grew up as a welfare child, and as he got older, he started hanging out more and more with his cousins, Robert Diggs and Gary Grice. The trio would share a love for music and kung fu movies, with RZA remembering ODB as a huge fan of rap and soul music. Growing up so close to it, they decided to give it a go themselves. Together they formed a group called Force of the Imperial Master and started going around the neighborhood, performing at local shows and challenging other MCs to battles. Since they lived in different boroughs, Gary and Russell would travel from Brooklyn out to Staten Island to meet up with Robert, looking for any opportunity to show their talent. Eventually, they released a single called All In Together Now, which was a huge success in the New York underground scene, and the trio decided to change the group name to the same name. Of course, they didn't rap under the government names and came up with more than a couple of aliases over the years. At the time, Grice, who would be later known as Jizza, was going under the name The Genius, Diggs or Riza as Prince Rakim or The Scientist, and Jones or ODB as The Specialist or Ace and Unique. Around this time, RZA formed another hip-hop group called the DMD Posse or Diggin' Down Crew. The group consisted of Raekwon, Ghostface Killa, New God, Inspector Deck, Puff Disciple, and Method Man. Before forming the Wu-Tang Clan, RZA and Jizza got signed to two different labels, Tommy Boy and Cold Chillin' Records. Both of them released one project each. Jizza released his debut album called Words From The Genius, and RZA released an EP titled Oh I Love You Rakim. Unfortunately, both underperformed commercially, and subsequently, both of them were dropped from their labels. Thankfully, what seemed like a step back at the time, in retrospect, was a blessing in disguise. All of them once again changed their aliases to Riza, Jizza, and Old Dirty Bastard, and in late 1992, by assembling six more members or molding two groups into one, they formed a hip-hop collective that would soon become one of the most iconic groups of the genre, calling it the Wu-Tang Clan. Its members included Riza, Jizza, Method Man, Break One, Ghostface Killer, Inspector Deck, You God, Master Killer, and ODB. Capadonna would also join the squad as a 10th member of the group a couple of years later. The group managed to gain a sizable underground following after releasing an independent single called Protect Your Neck in 1993. Though there was some difficulty in finding record label that would sign Wu-Tang Clan while still allowing each member to record solo albums with different labels, Lao Slash RCA Records finally agreed, releasing their debut album, Enter the Wu-Tang, 36 Chambers, in November 1993. The album was an instant hit, earning critical acclaim, selling 30,000 copies in its first week, and to date, being regarded as one of the greatest hip-hop albums of all time. Unfortunately, what might have seen as a year filled with highs also had a couple of lows. The same year, Old Dirty Bastard was convicted of second-degree assault for an attempted robbery, and in 1994, he was shot in the abdomen following an argument with another rapper. Thankfully, he miraculously survived the shooting without any long-term effects. The success of their debut album established the group as a creative and influential force in the 1990s, allowing individual members to negotiate solo contracts and launch solo careers, one of which was none other than ODB. Two years after their debut album, on March 28, 1995, ODB released his first solo album called Return of 36 Chambers, The Dirty Version. 
He used this welfare card as an album cover. It spawned hit singles like Brooklyn Zoo. I drop signs like girls be dropping babies. Enough to make a nigga go crazy. And shimmy shimmy yay. Shimmy shimmy yo, shimmy yeah, shimmy yeah. Give me the mic so I can take a whip. Which helped to propel the album to gold and eventually platinum status. The same year, he also collaborated with Mariah Carey for the remix version of her single, Fantasy. Baby, come on, baby, come on. When you walk by every night, talking sweet and looking fine. The success of the music and his unapologetically raw persona made him a superstar. With him appearing more and more on TV for his antics. Howdy! For example, soon after he collaborated with Mariah Carey, ODB appeared on MTV, making it one of the most legendary moments in MTV history. In the episode, ODB was being profiled for MTV biography when he took two of his three children at the time by limousine to a New York State welfare office to cash a $375 welfare check and receive food stamps while his latest album was still in the top 10 of US charts. Although he had recently received a $45,000 cash advance for his solo album and was earning a cut of profits from the Wu-Tang's debut album, he was still listed as eligible for welfare and food stamps due to the fact that he had not yet filed taxes for the current year. Nothing could come close to what ODB showed MTV in March of 1995. I show my welfare card and I get my money. With Wu-Tang Clan's album selling over a million copies, Wu-Tang is number one. And just days before his solo album entered the charts, ODB took MTV News along with his family in a limo to cash a welfare check. Anybody got a quarter? Thank you. So how much money you got here? When she put that card in there, for real, I didn't think it would work. I swear, but it worked. And we got food stamps. Come on. So we still on the system. Why would you want to get free money? Unfortunately, once again, the dark side of ODB's life was starting to become more and more prominent. And soon his presence in the media took a drastic turn. 1997 marks the start of many old dirty bastards runners with the law. Shortly after his food stamp stunt, ODB got arrested for a failure to pay child support for three of his children. News reported that Russell failed to pay nearly a year's worth of child support, around $35,000, for his wife, Isol and Jones. Throughout his life, it is alleged that ODB fathered a total of 13 children. The same year, he also appeared on Wu-Tang Clan's most commercially successful work, the double album called Wu-Tang Forever. With all the problems left in 1997, New Year came around, but what might have seen as a year of change quickly became a downward spiral. On February 24th, 1998, while sitting in his Brooklyn studio, ODB witnessed a car accident. He and a friend ran to the accident scene and organized a dozen of onlookers who assisted in lifting the 1996 Ford Mustang, rescuing a four-year-old girl from the wreckage. The girl was immediately taken to a hospital with first and second degree burns. Using a fake name, ODB visited the girl in the hospital frequently until he was spotted by the paparazzi. The next day, on February 25th, 1998, ODB rushed on stage unexpectedly as Sean Colvin took the stage to give her acceptance speech for the Song of the Year award. He announced he recently purchased expensive clothes in an anticipation of winning the award for the best rap album that he lost to Puff Daddy. I went and bought me an outfit today that costed a lot of money today. You know what I mean? Because I figured that Wu-Tang was going to win. I don't know how y'all see it, but when it comes to the children, Wu-Tang is for the children. We teach the children. You know what I mean? Puffy is good, but Wu-Tang is the best, okay? I want y'all to know that this is ODB and I love you all. Peace. The incident was widely covered in the media, and this would also mark one of his last quote-unquote positive appearances. In April of 1998, he pleaded guilty to a charge of attempted assault on Isil and Jones, his children's mother, resulting in a protection order against him. The following month, a bench warrant was issued for his arrest after he missed two court dates concerning his child support payments. He later showed up and signed an agreement to pay off the debt. 
On July 1st, 1998, ODB got robbed and shot in the back and the left arm after falling asleep in his girlfriend's house. According to the FBI files released in 2012, ODB was asleep in bed and awoke to a gun in his face. He immediately jumped up and started wrestling one of the guys. Not long after, the shots went off and ODB was shot in the back once with a bullet exiting through his left arm. If that wasn't enough, the robbers also stole the jewelry that he was wearing, valued at about $10,000. Thankfully, he survived the hit and even drove himself to the hospital, only to get checked out and left the hospital the same day, ignoring the hospital's request for overnight observation. The weird part about this case is that he wasn't alone with his girlfriend at home. In the same room, next to his bed, was his cousin sleeping and in the next room was his other cousin with a newborn baby. There were also a couple of other kids in the apartment, but weirdly enough, the robbers somehow knew where ODB was sleeping and nobody saw them entering the apartment. Before it all went down, ODB said that his sister heard that he was to be hit and his family allegedly knew who committed the robbery. He later refused to investigate who robbed him because he did not want to cause problems for his family, who still lived in the projects where the robbery occurred. Only days after being shot, Old Dirty Basta was arrested for shoplifting a pair of $50 shoes from a sneaker stadium in Virginia Beach, despite carrying close to $500 in cash at the time. More troubles followed. Only a couple of weeks later, his SUV was stolen from outside the recording studio. Despite the rough month, Dirty went ahead with his plans to tour. As a result, he missed several court dates concerning his Virginia Beach shoplifting incident, resulting in an order for his arrest. A couple of months later, ODB was arrested in Los Angeles for making terrorist threats. According to the story, he attended a concert by R&B singer Des Re at the House of Blues in West Hollywood and refused to be escorted outside by security, who'd grown tired of his drunken rowdiness. After they kicked him out, he returned and threatened to shoot the security staff, which is a felony in California, punishable up to three years in jail. Not two weeks after posting bail, he was kicked out of a hotel in Berlin, Germany for lounging in his balcony in the nude. In November, back in California, he was arrested again on more charges of making terrorist threats, this time allegedly threatening to kill an ex-girlfriend. ODB pleaded not guilty in both cases and returned to New York in January 1999. At this point, while it was still difficult to view ODB as a genuine criminal, despite his antics, it was more prominent than ever that his drug problems are only getting worse and worse each month. Shortly after he returned to New York, on January 14, 1999, he was pulled over for a traffic violation while driving with his cousin. What happened next was never fully clarified. The officers fired eight rounds at all dirty bastard, claiming that ODB got out of his vehicle and started shooting at them. He was arrested and charged with attempted murder and criminal weapon possession. However, the police were never able to produce matching weapon, ammunition, or empty ammo shells to support their claims, and there were also a multitude of conflicting stories reported from their side as to exact details of the incident. All the ammo shells found at the scene were from the officer's guns. ODB insisted that the officers had been scared by a cellular phone and not the gun. A month later, in February, a grand jury decided that there was not enough evidence and dismissed the case, after which an outraged ODB filed suit against the arresting officers. I took shots at me, now I'm taking shots back at y'all. Of course I'm going to file a lawsuit. As much money as I can get, I'm going to get it. Unfortunately, it didn't take long before ODB was once again in trouble. Just a couple of weeks later, he once again fell victim to the vagaries of the California legal system. After citing him for double parking his car in Hollywood, police discovered that he was driving without a license. Afterward, they decided to search him and found that he was wearing a bulletproof vest. While it may seem understandable, given his recent experience in New York, plus induced paranoia from the drugs in California, it was still a crime, prohibiting convicted violent felons to wear body armor. And because of his 1993 second degree assault conviction, ODB fell under that category. He went back to New York and once again, only a couple of weeks later, he was pulled over for another traffic violation. This time, he was driving without license plates. During the stop, police found a small amount of crack cocaine in his SUV, leading to misdemeanor drug possession charges. Five days later, ODB was pulled over yet again, once again cited for driving without license plates as well as driving with suspended license. In the face of this impossible legal maze, April brought one small bit of good news for ODB. The terrorist threat charges involving his ex-girlfriend were dismissed due to lack of evidence. 
The same year, former OG Simpson defense lawyer Robert Shapiro signed on as ODB's legal representative. Unfortunately, he wasn't as lucky as OJ and his run of the luck continued. At the end of July, he was jailed in California for failing to pay a portion of his bail from the House of Blues case. He acknowledged financial difficulties stemming from his legal bills but would later post the money and was released. Once again, it didn't last long. Only days later, he was arrested in New York after running a red light. He was still driving on a suspended license but this time, it was the least of his worries. During the search, police managed to find weed and 20 vials of crack cocaine in his car. He was arrested and this time charged with drug possession charges. He was able to post bail but didn't return to LA for a hearing in his body armor case, ultimately revoking his bail and a warrant for his arrest was issued. In mid-August, ODB checked himself into a rehab center in upstate New York, hoping to address his escalating problem with hard drugs. He was soon transferred to a different center in California and in November, his sentencing in two California cases, Body Armor and the House of Blues, came out to one year in rehab and three years of probation with no prison time. How he got away with all of it, only God knows. And hell, maybe he got as lucky as OJ did, but despite the resolution, ODB still complained during the sentencing hearing that he felt police had been targeting him excessively. That sense of persecution manifested itself in a January 2000s hearing in New York related to his drug charges. Apparently, exasperated by all the chaos, during the hearing, ODB ignored presiding judge, talked dirty to a female DA, in this typical fashion he reportedly called her a sperm donor, and took a nap in the middle of it, further erasing an inclination the prosecution had toward leniency. Afterward, he got drunk, violating the terms of his rehab program and probation conditions. Upon returning to California, he was kicked out of rehab and transferred to jail. Although he could have faced prison time for breaking probation, ODB received a more lenient sentence of 6 months in rehab. Up until this point, ODB managed to avoid prison time, getting away with basically a slap on the wrist, but clearly being heavily addicted to drugs, in need of help more than ever. Yet at the same time, his apparent unwillingness to be helped meant that for better or for worse, he was running out of chances. What might have seen as a possibility to at least get him sober and maybe turn a new leaf in his life, once again, took a dark turn. In October 2000, with just two months in rehab to go, ODB made a run for it. He escaped the court mandate rehab and spent one month as a fugitive. During this time, he didn't shy away from public eye and in his typical ODB fashion, he continued life as normal. He made his way across the country and spent some time with Riza recording music. He then appeared on stage at the Hammerstein Ballroom in New York, drinking from a bottle at the record release party for the new Wu-Tang Clan album, The W. He somehow managed to leave the facility without getting arrested, despite the large police presence, only adding more to his mystique. After a few more days on the run, ODB was eventually captured in a McDonald's parking lot in Philadelphia while signing autographs for a large crowd of fans. The crowd was so large that the restaurant manager called the police not knowing what was going on. He was arrested and extradited to New York where he stood trial on not only his prior drug charges but also various traffic violations and a charge that he violated the protection order on Isil and Jones in 1998. After several trial postponements, in April 2001, ODB accepted a deal from prosecutors that wiped out his other offenses in New York in exchange for a guilty plea to the cocaine possession charges. This time, he received the minimum sentence of 2 to 4 years in state prison and received credit for 8 months he already served. Moreover, he was allowed to serve the jail time he owed to the state of California concurrently. Despite the amazing deal, the daunting prospect of the state prison was nearly too much for ODB. In July, he had to be put on suicide watch pending a psychiatric evaluation. It was also later reported that he suffered a broken leg after being assaulted in a holding facility. In 2003, ODB was released from jail and while a lot of hoped for a new and at least a little bit less chaotic all dirty bastard, their wish was never fulfilled. Unfortunately, only a year after his release, on November 13, 2004, two days before his 36th birthday, at approximately 4.35 pm, old dirty bastard collapsed at Riza's recording studio. He was pronounced dead at the scene. The official cause of death was a drug overdose, with an autopsy showing a lethal mixture of cocaine and the prescription opioid tramadol. The overdose was ruled to be accidental. Despite his antics and troubles with the law, he was one of the most unique and charismatic artists of the 1990s. Rest in peace, Russell Tyrone Jones.